Everybody ready? Great. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, this is our second meeting on the House COVID-19 Employment, Workforce, and Business Recovery Committee. Um, would like to thank staff who has worked and put up with me dealing with this, so I appreciate it. Michael, Jimmy, we appreciate it. Um, I would ask that uh, each committee member, starting with Mr. Blackwell, working back this way, introduce themselves, if we have a minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Barb Blackwell, District 81, Aiken. Good afternoon. My name is Cambrell Garvin, District 77, Richland County, covering uh, Northeast Columbia and Blythewood. Uh, Representative Kirkman Finley, uh, House District 75 in Richland County. Joe Jefferson, Berkeley and Dorchester Counties, District 102. Good to be with you. Good afternoon. Paula Calhoun, District 87, representing Lexington County. Um, at this point, I'm going to ask Representative Garvin to open us up with a prayer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come together on this day to do the work of the people of South Carolina. We ask that you allow our meeting to our meeting uh, to be helpful and allow it to be productive and allow us to come up with positive uh, solutions for the great people of the state. Lord, we ask that you help and bless all those folks that have been impacted by this terrible contagion, Lord. We ask that you bless those grieving families and those who, who may still be struggling. Amen. Amen. Um, at this point, I am going to go on and ask the South Carolina Department of Social Services to come forward and present uh, Director Leach, just if you don't mind, introduce your staff who all is here with you, and we will proceed from there. Uh, Chairman Finley and members, um, uh, my name is Mike Leach. I'm the director of the Department of Social Services. Uh, along with me today, I have uh, Emily Parks, our chief of staff, Don Grant, our chief financial officer, Amber Gillum, our deputy director of economic services and Conley Ann Ragley, our legislative liaison. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you the work our agency has done amidst the pandemic to serve our citizens of South Carolina. I understand that there were specific questions from Representative Erickson regarding our support to child care providers at your last meeting. I will give you an update on our activities in that area, along with some overviews from our other programs, uh, including child welfare, child support, and economic services. In the wake of COVID-19 emergency, DSS has taken steps to continue our critical mission of providing food and financial assistance and promoting the safety and well-being of our ch children and vulnerable adults in South Carolina. This has been the most tremendous challenge in all of our careers to continue operations in the manner that is seamless as the pandemic has magnified our financial and technological weaknesses at, at DC DSS. We at DSS know we have critical mission to serve some of South Carolina's most vulnerable citizens, and that mission does not stop in the middle of a pandemic. In fact, it could be said that our mission is more critical than ever, with many South Carolinians experiencing unemployment, increased need, and increased stress and anxiety during this time. We issued $107 million in Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, benefits each month from March to May, compared to the, the regularly 67 million we were issuing prior to that. Uh, in, in February and before. We received 48,000 SNAP and temporary assistance TANF applications for March and 47,000 in April. That's a 400, uh, 146% and 143% increase over the number of applications re received in February, respectively. South Carolina's SNAP caseload has increased by approximately 27,000 cases and over 43,000 clients, February to May. And the last time it was at this level was in August 2018. During the pandemic, South Carolina has also experienced 27 tornadoes. DSS provided SNAP replacement benefits for 15,000 households, totaling 4.2 million in federal benefits. We've taken several measures to address the barriers SNAP households have faced in the wake of the pandemic. Received approval on a waiver from FNS Food and Nutrition Services to allow us to provide emergency supplement to address temporary food needs to households already receiving SNAP benefits and those new applicants who meet the eligibility requirements. 
This waiver brought, us, brought all current SNAP households up to the maximum benefit from March uh, through July. We temporarily suspended able-bodied adults without dependents and TANF work requirements to minimize disruption and benefits. We've adjusted certification periods for existing SNAP recipients to minimize interruptions and benefits to low-income households. We received approval from FNS to adjust the SNAP application process to eliminate the need for in-person or telephone eligibility interview, and that allows for quicker and more efficient processing of SNAP applications and approval for benefits. Also in March, we sought for and received approval to waive the requirements related to overpayments of claims for SNAP and TANF. Uh, we are working on getting this extended through the end of July as well. SNAP recipients will soon be able to purchase eligible food item, items online with an EBT card. July 31st is a target start date for online use of SNAP uh, benefits in South Carolina. And at this time, the USDA has authorized Walmart and Amazon for online food purchasing. We are hoping that our local retailers and independent grocers within the state of South Carolina are able to gain authorization from the federal government to participate by the end of the summer in order to support local businesses and the state economy. And then we just announced yesterday, DSS is getting ready to stand up our Pandemic Electronic Benefit Transfer, or PEBT, program in South Carolina. It's a state option introduced um, under CARES. The general premise is that with the prolonged school closures, children are consuming meals at home that they otherwise would have at school through national free or reduced price meals under the Richard B. Russell National Lunch School Act, further straining uh, families' uh, financial difficulties during this time. So it allows the state to provide a one-time benefit to qualifying children to help supplement family food costs, and there are two primary eligibility categories. The categories are children in K through 12 schools whose schools have opted to participate in the community eligibility provision, regardless of individual family income levels. South Carolina has 521 CEP schools with an enrollment of 255,000 children as of March 13th. Children who are enrolled in free, free or reduced price meal programs in all other South Carolina schools, which is approximately 205,000 uh, kids as of March 13th, will, will qualify. Uh, we worked with DOE and they gave us data to deploy this program. The Department of Education uh, determines eligibility, so there's no applications for families. Um, so we expect, um, we expect that the current SNAP households will receive this benefit um, uh, July 7th or later, just based on their EBT uh, when that funding is going in, and that will be about $330 per child. Uh, that basically the math behind that, so you understand it's about $5.70 times 58 school days that were missed, and that equates to $330. For folks, for non-SNAP households, um, EBT cards will be mailed to address on file with the school district between July 20th and July 24th. Um, at this point, we estimate the PEBT will bring roughly $154 million in additional federal SNAP benefits in the hands of families and South Carolina's economy over the next six to eight weeks. In our child welfare area, um, even amidst the pandemic, we've continued to see improvements in our child welfare program metrics, a decrease in bed days, an increase in placement with kinship caregivers, an increase in 4E eligibility resulting in increased federal funding drawdown. But we've also seen our child abuse and neglect and vulnerable adult abuse intake call centers um, who are operating normal. But at the height of the reporting, uh, we've seen a huge decrease in the reporting in, in those two um, areas. Uh, and the, uh, the decrease, the, the largest decrease happened between April 4th uh, April 6th and April 12th when we saw a 55% decrease in child abuse and neglect reports received when compared with one year ago at this time. Drops in reporting uh, are, are, are normal when summer occurs, but they're not normal um, usually during April and May when that is usually our highest reporting period due to um, uh, uh, Child Abuse Prevention Month. We believe that the reports of uh, uh, Currently, uh, for the week of 622 through 623, re re reports of abuse and neglect of children are only down 6% compared to one year ago, 
and reports of vulnerable adults have actually increased by one compared to one year ago. We've also begun an aggressive social media and earned media blitz, encouraging the public to support or call it in. Thanks to several media providers and the Outdoor Advertising Association of, of South Carolina, DSS is running digital billboard PSAs at no cost to the state, encouraging the public to support suspected abuse of children and vulnerable adults. Additionally, thanks to the collaboration with the creative media staff at DHEC, we at DSS were able to create a 30-second PSA on the same subject. The PSA is running on television stations statewide thanks to donated time by Comcast and Spectrum Charter Communications. We've been sending frequent communication regarding coronavirus COVID to our DSS professionals, group home providers, child placing agencies, and foster parents with detailed guidance and practice for increasing social distancing, limiting numerous staff visits, and increasing flexibility with protocols and practice. We've been using alternative technology-based visitation practices, reducing in-person contract monitoring visits, but we have been maintaining current practice with investigations and OHAN to ensure safety of children and facilities and that allegations are investigate, investigated timely and properly. We are providing PPE for our staff to utilize when there is a risk of exposure. We're also working with the courts to conduct more virtual hearings to reduce the backlog of cases and increase permanency of children. Over the last 12 weeks of the pandemic, we've successfully finalized over 100 adoptions and reunified over 150 families. We also had a temporary waiver uh, for education and enrollment and employee requirements so youth and young adults in aftercare can temporarily remain in licensed DSS placement um, until age 21 and after. We're recognized in the national news sources as one of the only nine states to have enacted this protection for our youth and young adults. And then because of the, the, fi the, fi the federal increase in our federal medical assistance percentage rate due to current uh, federal state of emergency, DSS has been able to provide an additional $90 per month temporary increase to board rates to foster, foster families. In our adult advocacy area, we continue to investigate abuse and neglect cases while following pro appropriate protocols to keep our frontline professionals safe. APS is making virtual check-ins with the adults who are in the APS system and, and not in danger. And part of adult advocacy, we are responsible for administering and monitoring state and federal funds to support local domestic violence programs. Uh, in working with our domestic violence programs, uh, we, were, we were able to secure and distribute PPE to local programs which, with help from SCABASA in distributing these items. And then we also received 534,000 in an additional Family Violence Prevention and Services Act funding through the CARES Act. Funding received will be able to utilize the, the uh, domestic violence programs will be able to uh, utilize it to assist in assessing needs for domestic violence survivors, supporting programs, shelter options and supplies that would reduce the exposure to the risk of COVID and promoting the continuity of services for survivors of domestic violence. DSS will deploy this funding in a form of one-time $40,000 grants to each of the 13 programs DSS works with statewide. The department is planning for an early July effective date to distribute the grant funding to the 13 domestic violence programs. In our child support area, we are working to provide the financial support to deserving children while also considering the impact of COVID-19 emergency on non-custodial parents whose employment is affected. We collected over 15.6 million in total child support collections on May 5th alone. This was our largest single day collection ever. Our child support team dispersed over $10 million of that collection amount in the same day to South Carolina families. PACs worked well to deploy the funds and we heard from other states who struggled um, in this area with these increases um, despite having more staff. Um, uh, we were able to, to manage this and continue this through our PAC system and, uh, and our uh, child support teams. While the federal government requ requires certain enforcement measures to remain, the Child Support Division has relaxed most of its administrative enforcement remedies, including license suspensions, liens against financial assets, and credit bureau reporting at this time. Moving on to child care, our Division of Early Care and Education within the Department of Social Services is the government agency responsible for the licensing and oversight of specific child care programs. 
We know that child care is a necessity for most families in America, and as the largest child serving agency in South Carolina, DSS has a responsibility to help parents access safe, affordable, quality child care. Our child care staff work hard to ensure that children are provided a safe, nurturing, and high quality environment into which to learn and grow. And even before COVID, South Carolina was experiencing a deficit in the number of needed child care providers, which uh, the state deemed a child care desert because of lack of, of, of available child care. Child care providers across the country oper operate on razor thin margins and with very little cash reserves. And the partial or complete loss of revenue to these small businesses have experienced um, create significant concerns for our partners and providers. Approximately eight weeks ago, South Carolina received about 63 million in additional federal child care funding through um, the Federal Coronavirus Aid Relief and uh, Economic Securities Act, the CARES Act. DSS is using these funds to implement three primary assistance strategies designed to help essential workers and our child care providers. One of the actions DSS took immediately upon receiving these funds was to open the SC voucher program to provide child care assistance to workers deemed essential during the COVID-19 response without regard to the regular income eligibility requirements. The purpose of this program is to help essential workers pay for child care while they report to work during the COVID-19 emergency. In other words, those engaged in providing essential services, those involved in making sure the public has access to critical resources, and those involved in critical infrastructure operations. The next slide I'll show uh, will break down the industries uh, and, the, and the population served. Due to the overwhelming response to this part of the funding, the application period for the benefit closed on May 8th. DSS received approximately 9,428 applications for assistance. As of June 29th, 7,338 have been approved, 605 denied, and 1,485 are pending. Approximately $33 million is obligated for the current 7,338 approvals thus far. The second primary response activity DSS implemented with the additional CARES Act funding is cleaning grants. The purpose of the grant is to allow providers to clean and sanitize their center, family or group home, child care, which may allow them to reopen or to continue to purchase additional cleaning supplies um, throughout. As of June 29th, DSS had issued 750 cleaning grants. DSS is still accepting applications for these cleaning grants. Information about how to apply and the application form are posted on our schildcare.org website. Approximately 1.28 million in CARES funding has been allocated for these cleaning grants and we've uh, obligated 674,000 at this point in time. And lastly, on Wednesday, May 20th, we stood up a program to deploy larger grants to licensed and registered child care facilities to help providers who have had to close or who are open and have lost revenue due to low enrollments during the last several weeks. These one-time grants are designed to assist providers in paying for their child care facility expenses, including rent, mortgage payments, utility bills, cleaning or sanitation costs, and personnel costs. As of June 29th, DSS had reads, received uh, 1,750 applications in the amount of 17,379,000, and that represents 71% of our total eligible providers at this point. Total allocated thus far for the three programs is 51,453,000 out of the 63 million um, that was provided through the CARES Act. We've worked with DHEC to provide guidance and guidelines to assist child care providers in reopening quickly and safely and what to do in a presumed uh, positive COVID case. And both sets of guidance were included your, in your packet with today's presentation. The, this slide is, is showing, it's hard to see for you guys, but it is showing that uh, uh, the vouchers um, the graph shows the breakdown of types of industries that DSS has approved for the voucher program to provide the child care assistance. Of the 7,338 approved vouchers for essential employees, 46% were medical professionals, 10% were government employees, 6.2% were in banking and financial professions, 5.8% were child care workers, 5% were first, first responders. The remaining 26% of positions were from a variety of other professions as depicted on the slide including retail and food service, among others. On May 26th, over 60 DSS staff worked with 
uh, EMD, Forestry Commission, Commerce, and the South Carolina National Guard to source and distribute PPE supplies to child care centers to assist in reopening or remaining opening. Items included hand sanitizer, sanitizing wipes, sanitizing spray, masks, and gloves. The cost of the PPE at no cost to the, the facility uh, was about, to the facilities was around 382,000, not including contracted services around trucking or planning, et cetera. While there are no executive orders from Governor McMaster mandating closure of child care centers in the state, at least 47% 40, of our child care centers have remained open through the emergency. And as of yesterday, 1,476 or 61% of child care centers are open across the state. To ensure there was adequate adequate child care resources to meet the needs throughout the pandemic, we also quickly worked with organizations to allow for and set up temporary child care sites as outlined in statute. These organizations are allowed to operate for 30 days without a full license and must be approved by our licensing, DSS licensing unit. There are approximately 11 temporary centers currently in operation with a licensing capacity of 317 children. We have also continued to provide SC voucher funding to child care centers, even amidst closure for enrolled children. As of June 29th, 18,000 children in South Carolina were receiving child care assistance through the SC voucher program. And then we've also partnered with Merchant Food Services to set up four access points across the state for providers to obtain needed food resources for their child care centers. DSS has worked diligently through the pandemic to record additional costs incurred as a result of the agency's response to COVID, as well as to anticipate additional costs that may result through 2020. As of last week's update, we incurred approximately 1.6 million in relief fund eligible costs and anticipate over 25 million in total eligible costs that could be charged against the relief fund by the end of the calendar year. These things uh, would include janitorial facility cleaning of, of, of many of our locations, state vehicles, PPE, our response efforts, um, our PEBT vendor payments to issue the, payments, uh, issue the benefits for the PEBT. We had to make a lot of adjustments with that. Remote working and learning, uh, so uh, getting Chromebooks out and other resources, uh, other tech technological resources, and payroll. While we've begun expanding amounts of certain categories already, given the agency's existing Budgetary constraints um, and due to our house approved budget still hanging in the place while we operate under continuing resolution, we're looking, to guide, we're looking to guide house to provide interpretation on certain items of cost prior to obligating our limited current dollars. DSS looks forward to working with guide house to better understand how it will interpret the guidance from US Treasury around our allowable costs. And in summary, COVID-19 has disrupted business as usual. In, in many ways and has amplified our weaknesses in this agency and just how under-resourced we are. There's no playbook for how to do this work in the middle of a pandemic, but I've tried to lead the agency by communicating early and often, being transparent and keeping the needs, both physical and emotional of our staff, clients and South Carolina citizens in mind with every decision that needs to be made. Our DSS team members at every level of the agency have worked tirelessly to continue providing services under unprecedented circumstances and every area of our agency has adapted its practices and processes to the state of emergency. And even in the middle of the pandemic, we have continued to move this work forward. And with your help, we can continue our goal of striving for excellence in our service of one in every six South Carolinians. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Director Leach, for being here on today. Um, allow me to first of all say that I've heard great things from constituents uh, about the work that DSS has been doing throughout this pandemic. So thank you and thank your team for, for all of the, of the amazing work that you're doing um, amidst these uh, unprecedented times. I do have a couple questions regarding um, child care, um, uh, those facilities. I know that DSS provided uh, funding for PPE a, a couple um, uh, a month, uh, recently. Um, does DSS have additional funding set aside for continued PPE grants uh, to child care centers um, that will assist in additional COVID related costs? Are there any funds still available for continued um, PPE? Yeah, so I think when we, uh, I, I, that's a great question, and I think when we um, figure out, when we complete the, the you know, with the 7,335 
vouchers mm -hmm. for essential employees. When we get to that 9,000 and we have that number, and then we get to close to that 100% of uh, the other operating grant, we're gonna see what's left and determine the need for providers in any way. I mean, that, no, that money is, needs to be spent with our local providers. And, right. and um, it could be for that or it could be something else that we, they, they may be sure. needing at that point. A absolutely, because what I'm hearing is that a, a lot of those centers have already used those resources and are starting to trying to pay that cost out of pocket. Um, another question for you. Um, I, has, I know some, 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 some other states like Virginia have used or have provided incentive pay. Have there been any conversations, and this may not be a question that you can answer, but for providing incentive pay for child care workers? We, we have not discussed that. I mean, I guess that it, I, I have to look towards Amber to see if that's a flexibility within the CARES mm -hmm. Act. Uh, most states have been using uh, the CARES Act child care money very similarly. Mm -hmm. um, some states obviously got a lot more dollars due to mm -hmm. um, census sure. type data that leads to that. Um, what I can say is though, talking to other uh, state agencies that are doing this work across the country, the money that's been provided is not enough mm -hmm. to, um, uh, the longer this goes, um, the more of a crisis our child care centers mm -hmm. are gonna be in, um, especially mm -hmm. with low enrollment. Um, uh, so that, that money is, we're, 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 we're going through it very quick. I see. Um, we will be, probably dipping into um, some other child care block grant funds okay. that is allowable mm -hmm. to be able to help try to make sure that we are um, keeping this rolling. Very good, and I think you kind of answered my last question, which dealt with keeping those, keeping our centers operational and keeping them open. So so I think I think you kind of covered that just now which, with, with your statement, correct? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, everyone, I, but before we go forward, I would like to represent, uh, recognize Representative Bernstein, who came in late, and Representative Cogswell, who I think is on the phone. Uh, Representative McDowell, I think you had a question. Yeah, I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to recognize you as well. I'm sorry, you were in here a little earlier. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. You always have a good day, Dallas. <laughs> what I did, I did. <laughs> Some days it is not what you, you know, you know, you know how we have those days that nothing seems to work? I'm having one of those, so I apologize. Look, you and me both have yep. I also want to thank your staff for being here. Um, my question is a little bit different, and I'm not exactly sure um, if you can answer it, but I know the Department of Education had stated that there were some large number of, of students that were unidentified. Is there any communication between, their, between DOT and your agency to try to identify these students um, that are deemed, quote, missing? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, we do have a, a meeting with Superintendent Spearman on Monday. Um, a couple of my team, uh, Emily Parks and, and Conley Ann, did meet with some of their team earlier uh, this week, or I'm sorry, last Friday, uh, to discuss those lists and that data. Um, the department remains ready to identify, find, locate uh, any of those children or youth um, uh, when the data is provided. Um, uh, in support of the Department mm -hmm. of Education, we, we will, um, uh, we are ready for that. And, and also when we, it, that information will also be looking at our data as well to see if there's, you know, cross-referencing any of that. Um, you know, this, this is a challenging time for DOE and us. I mean, mm -hmm. again, our child abuse and neglect numbers decreased significantly throughout this time, um, more so than a normal summer. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that, and, and that has a lot to do with school being out and our mm -hmm. teachers who love and support these these children are mandated reporters and are um, you know calling that line and and child care as well and so uh, when there aren't those eyes and ears mm -hmm. um, you're gonna see those numbers decrease and and you know we we have a, a worry what that looks like when school comes back um, but we are willing to support Department of Education and in, in, um, doing what is is needed to to locate children and youth okay. and then I understand you um, clearly that several of your, ch your, your child care centers did not close doing this and they were still open and still providing uh, services? So the, the child care centers, 46% of the child care centers mm -hmm. throughout this whole pandemic thus far never closed. Wow. 
um, we're up to 61% who are open. So um, there has been a, an increase, uh, and we saw an increase uh, prior to uh, June that was pretty significant, and then June is kind of uh, tapered off a little bit. So we're seeing e every day we might see one or two. So through this week, I think we saw maybe 10 open okay. increased. And, and finally, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I know our work of this committee is basically the recovery of small businesses. So have this child care centers or any other um, small businesses that offer services through DSS, have they given you anything that you can share with us? that we might can do to help? I, I think another, another group, uh, the child care centers, I mean, I, I think are, uh, yeah, a, a group that is affected with this. And, and listen, there, there, was a, there was a child care crisis prior to the pandemic, and this has just mm -hmm. heightened it. Um, but we also work with our partners, our child placing agencies on the child welfare side, our group homes, who have been affected by this um, tremendously as well. And they, those, I would consider those all small businesses. Um, uh, as they're taking care of our, our children um, and have staff who are uh, anxious and, and um, dealing with, you know, taking, taking care of our kids on a daily basis. So it's been a strain on them as well. Uh, Amazon and Walmart. So the federal government chose those two, um, and the federal government makes the decisions on the the grocery stores or the local retailers that can participate in this. Um, six other states currently have additional retailers, local retailers, um, and the local retailers have to go through the USDA FNS to get approval to be part of. Um, this online purchasing and we've we've contacted the retail association to make them aware that there's an opportunity out there we want to make sure that our local um, uh, grocers and and retailers have access to this uh, as well as Amazon and and um, Walmart and you may have answered this already but have you gotten any infected children or staff from any of the centers up to this point Yes, yeah, so uh, internally at DSS, we have 47. We've had, since the beginning, we've had 47 um, positive uh, COVID uh, staff members across the state. Um, we actually only had 13 up until early June. Um, and so since June, we've seen a, a tripling of that number. Um, we have seen some foster parents who have been COVID positive. We do have some youth, um, uh, less than 10, who have um, a positive uh, exposure. Um, uh, some are in foster homes, some are in group homes, and so we're working with those centers um, to make sure that we put in all the safety protocols uh, and, and actually have a, a, a the child, um, our group homes and our child placing agencies, we actually have a call scheduled with Dr. Trexler uh, coming up in the next couple weeks to make sure that we all are <laughs> doing everything we need to do to make sure that our children and our staff are safe. Thanks for your service. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Back row. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Leach, uh, thank you for the report. Lots of information here, and I have a couple of questions. The, uh, the assistance strategies that you came up with, uh, did the CARES Act dictate what, how to spend that money, or is that just something that the staff themselves uh, formulated in terms of what to do with the money? The CARES Act uh, gave um, uh, a list of identified areas that we could be supporting um, uh, the, the child care centers. And we um, talked with multiple other states to kind of see what they were doing um, in moving this direction. So in terms of cleaning grants, operation grants, that was the CARES Act kind of helped you with those? They, formulate they, those ideas yeah, they, or they those provided, programs? Yes, and they were, uh, there were our <laughs> webinars through FNS um, uh, as well. I mean, not FNS, but the, uh, uh, the child care side of it to, to kind of give ideas on how to use this money. 
Okay, and the operation grants, those were true grants, that's not a loan, right? It's just no, a grant. Correct, it's uh, between five and $15,000 based on capacity size. No, they um, say the average looks to be about $10,000 per center. Correct. And how does that uh, impact PPP qualifications? Most of the uh, centers also qualify or apply for the PPP money? Or? Uh, the, the centers could qualify. I don't know how many uh, applied for the PPP. But the, this money, again, it's, it's a very simple application process. You just pretty much put in your information um, and you know, basically say you're going to use it for this wide variety of things that I mentioned earlier. Right, it seems like it might be a bit of an overlap with the PPP in terms of the money's used for payroll and operational costs, that type of thing. That's uh, similar to what the PPP was, is designed to do as well. Didn't know if they had to offset uh, their PPP application in response to what they were getting in terms of a grant or not. No, I, I, I think this, this was uh, completely separate. Totally separate, yep. okay. And one other question, regarding the, uh, the centers that have stayed open versus those that have closed, what's been the primary reason for closures? Is it uh, personnel, is it lack of demand, uh, you know, concern over the virus itself, or, or basically all of the above? Yeah, um, I have that specific answer for you. Um, Take your time. So uh, reasons providers for have cited for remaining closed, that was the question? Right, why they yeah. closed, why, why some stayed open, why some closed? So, so some closed initially and, and have remained as they were following the school schedule. Uh, following, um, they've reported, sometimes uh, reported we heard following the governor's executive orders, but there was nothing related to childcare. Um, waiting for, for parents to return to work. So it is the supply and demand aspect right. of it, and it continues to be. Um, waiting on board uh, boards, uh, directors to discuss or vote on reopening, um, and uh, waiting on COVID case numbers to decline are some of the reasons that folks, um, as we contacted them to understand uh, when they'd be reopening, what are reasons for not reopening. Those right. are some of the answers we and got. And have you had centers that have had outbreaks within the particular class and, and do they contact you or do they contact DHEC or what kind of assistance do you provide so to the small business owner when they have an issue like that? Correct. So initially um, there was some confusion on that and there has been some, um, but we have uh, DHEC did, uh, uh, DHEC did come up with guidance on uh, what happens when there's a, a COVID positive or COVID exposure. Um, I believe you guys have that guidance, uh, but they sent that to us for review and, and making any changes. But um, uh, we have heard from uh, some folks that, that that's been very helpful, um, that guidance uh, in, in moving forward. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Leach, hi. Paula Calhoun. How are you this afternoon? I'm well. Thank you. Good. This is just really quick. Um, this kind of goes on the back of what Miss Annie McDaniels was mentioning about DOE and um, DSS as it relates to the children that are missing. Actually, they're not missing. We right. just can't find them as far as their educational needs. But I just want to make sure sometimes other families will recognize an abuse situation than an educational situation. And I just want to make sure that we're doing all that we can on PSAs and things like that to make sure that we're funneling those people that need assistance with abuse to where they need to be. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, through the billboards and social media and um, our county offices doing a lot of outreach with law enforcement, Department of Education. We uh, initially focused um, with uh, Department of Education on making sure that if there, uh, virtually if there were things going on, um, that if, if there was a suspicion of abuse and neglect to make sure they called us. Also, uh, Department of Mental Health has uh, lots of school-based counselors and they continue to do much of their work uh, virtually as well and, and have continued throughout the summer. So. Um, we've, uh, you know, if they suspect abuse and neglect, we have conversations with them. Um, but we have been trying to make sure that we get it out there that it, it could be anybody, right, that, that, you know, might witness abuse and neglect and they need to give us a call. Well, let me know if I can help in Lexington County. Thank you. You know, an interesting day for a question like this, but uh, what was y'all's carry forward from the last fiscal year since we are in the first fiscal day of the new year? 
I'm going to turn that over to my chief financial officer, Don Grant, to answer that. But I believe it was pretty much, I'll let him answer. Uh, yes, uh, Representative Kelly, it was less than $1,000, very little, and that was basically just a, a timing and journal entry. Okay. So yes, my question becomes, I don't see the state budget getting significantly better. Um, I think everything we're discussing is going to push that. I'm sure there's some CARES money that's going to be appropriated at some point, but are you all working on a plan that how we – I understand the rough issues that you brought forward, but to I, I think it will be hard to believe that the budget that starts today is going to be as – full as last year. Do y'all have a plan for that or are y'all developing one because I know we're operating under a continuing resolution right now, but that is so we can assess where we are. Do y'all have a plan? Are you developing one? And at what point will everyone be, ama be made aware of what those priorities are and how we're going to rearrange because I just don't see the number being the same next year as, or is it this year as it was last year? Sorry, the, the, the move of a day has gotten me. Yeah, and, and we, we fully understand that. Um, we had six priority areas that we laid out uh, to the House, and um, uh, we, uh, we know that we are going to have to reprioritize um, uh, those, those priorities. Um, and the uh, emphasis um, of the priorities is going to have to be on the child welfare aspect of it. Um, and that's mainly due to uh, caseloads, uh, potential caseloads, uh, and um, uh, our Michelle H. lawsuit settlement agreement as well. So what I would ask is if there is a way that y'all could forward to Michael a two or three page draft idea outline. I get it. It's hard work. And I mean that because nobody really knows what the numbers are going to look like. But with your best guess laid out so we can see it, because I understand that you, y'all were screaming for money before this. And I understand that the pitch is probably going to get higher. But I also want to make sure we understand what federal money you think you're going to get and how we can be prepared in September to, to understand the potential unfolding crisis and how we can help deal with it. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, yep. we, we can do that. Michael, can we make sure that we get that set? Thank you. Thank you all. Yep. We will move on. Um, at this point, I believe it's DHEC. Thank you, Chairman Finley, members of the committee, and other distinguished guests. I'm Dr. Brandon Traxler, and I'm a physician with DHEC, and I'm serving in the medical officer role in our COVID-19 incident response. As of yesterday, DHEC was reporting 100, or sorry, 1,741 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the state. This was a 19% positive rate for the cases reported yesterday. It took our total for statewide to date for confirmed cases to 36,297. There were 17 new confirmed deaths reported yesterday, which brought our death total to date to 735 individuals in the state from COVID-19. There have been 102 probable cases as of yesterday and four probable deaths reported. Those have, both remain, those have all been reported since June 14th when we began tracking that information. As you can see here, by week since we began in early March, we were relatively flat for several weeks for our curve. This is what we call the epi curve, and you've all heard the saying, flatten the curve. This is what people look at. You can see, however, that the last several weeks we have 
greatly increased week to week. As of yesterday, there were 1,021 patients that were hospitalized with COVID-19 in the state, which represented 13.4% of inpatients. There was a 71.5% hospital bed utilization rate in the state, including 72.1% of ICU beds being used. 21.7% of available ventilators were in use yesterday statewide. There had been 100 and 71,675 tests performed during the month of June alone through June 29th. This has exceeded uh, DHEC's original goal to test 2% of the population or 110,000 individuals in June. And during June, we actually increased that goal to 140,000, which we uh, easily passed. We currently have 175 static testing sites or statewide as well as 64 mobile or pop-up testing events scheduled through uh, the month of July. And that number continues to increase each day as more get added. There have been 39,112 calls to the DHEC care line since this began through June 29th. Looking at businesses, currently DHEC has available three pieces of guidance on our website for businesses that are looking to remain open or reopen since this began. One is reopening guidance for businesses for those who elected to close and are bringing their workforce back. Another is specific to food safety operations and is a toolkit for them for reopening with various materials as well for employees and employers. And the last is the most recent one, which I believe you have a copy of, which is the interim guidance uh, for COVID-19 scenarios for businesses. That is the one that I'm gonna review with you here today. And this is available on our website in Spanish and in English. This uh, matrix goes through several scenarios that are the most common ones that, thank you, <laughs> you're receiving a copy of now, uh, that, you, that an employer or an employee might encounter. With of course the first one being uh, a situation in which an employee tests positive for COVID-19. It gives the information uh, that the employer should try to obtain from the employee. Uh, the duration and criteria for release from isolation for that sick individual, and a risk assessment and guidance for their coworkers, both close contacts and other ex potentially exposed individuals. The next category on the matrix is uh, sick but has not been tested, and that is for an employee who has symptoms uh, that could be consistent with COVID-19 but has not yet been tested or is waiting on their test results. Um, certainly, if they have not been tested, the Number one piece of guidance other than staying home and away from other people is to seek testing. Uh, this then gives guidance for what happens after they are tested, if they are positive, negative, or if um, they still do not wish to get tested and, and remain feeling ill but don't have a definitive diagnosis. The third scenario is for a close contact of a case. And this could be where an employee is um, a close contact anywhere in their life, in the workforce, in their social life, or even a household contact of someone who has tested positive. It gives the quarantine guidance, uh, including for the duration, which does vary depending on if they are a household contact potentially or um, a uh, other close contact. It also gives testing recommendations based on the new CDC guidance that recommends that close contacts be tested after the seven day point into um, their quarantine period. The fourth category is for um, an employee who is a close contact of, or a household contact of someone who is sick but has not been tested. Um, the guidance for this is that to allow the individual, the employee, to continue to work unless the ill person tests positive. The contact of a contact is one that um, is a scenario that we frequently encounter. And this is an example where an employee is um, living with someone or is otherwise a close contact to an individual, a middle person who was a close contact to a case. So there are a couple of people removed from the actual um, sick person. Uh, and in that case, they are not at increased risk and do not need to do anything um, out of the ordinary more than the rest of us need to do, unless that middle person with whom they were a close contact uh, becomes sick and tests positive. The final scenario is um, an employee patron 
and that is where an employee for any type of business was a patron at a restaurant uh, that had a worker test positive. And there's nothing special in this situation that the employee needs to do apart from all of the rest of us with, of course, social distancing and mask wearing, but also being self-aware of any signs and symptoms of COVID-19 that might develop. And then, of course, self-isolating and seeking testing if they feel ill. Accelerate South Carolina, in conjunction with DHEC, SC Labor Licensing and Regulation, and SC Department of Commerce has established a call center for employees or employers or individuals in the public who have further questions about the various guidances available through Accelerate SC. They are staffed uh, from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. daily, Monday through Friday. And that number is 1-833-722-2578. And they also have a form that you can fill out on their website uh, to uh, receive information back uh, from Accelerate SC. And that concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you. Um, of those 39,000 calls, probably 1,500 of them were for me. And what I want to make sure everybody understands is there's been a lot of work on this flow chart. I wish we'd gotten it sooner, but this is a very important piece because I have had numerous constituents call me Saturday morning, Sunday morning, scared to death, trying to understand how they negotiate an employee who hasn't worked for 10 days, who tested positive. How do they deal with bringing them back? Can they bring them back? How do they clean their store? What do they need to do? And I think that we need to, as we can continue to beef this up and make it more usable and more readily apparent, some of the fear and terror will go away. That is an incredibly important part. You know, and I think the thing that we have to reiterate is that staying six feet away from each other is the best defense. That is better than masks. That is, that is masks are an accoutrement to that. Everything we do needs to have social distancing. And one of the problems that I see immediately is people walking up to each other talking in masks. They don't replace each other. Again, I want to thank you. At this point, I'll turn it over for any questions. Yes, sir, Mr. Jefferson. Not a question. Just want to applaud and to thank DHEC and all of your employees for being so cooperative, you've really done a great job throughout the state. I can tell you, I got tested last week, and I got a call nine o'clock three nights later, and I wanted to know, are you guys working around the clock? Nine o'clock at night, they called and said, Mr. Jefferson, you were positive, you were uh, negative, <clears throat> which was a great relief for me, and my wife was also negative. But to know that you guys are working 24-7 is commendable. And I just want to thank you for all that uh, you continue to do for the citizens here in South Carolina. Thank you, sir. I will pass Jeff, the message Mr. along. Mr. Gambrell, and then, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Dr. Traxler, for being here. And I want to echo those same sentiments from my colleagues. Thank you, DHEC, for all of your hard work. I, I think it's ironic, and this is a, a, a statement's last question. I think it's ironic how at the initial start of COVID-19, uh, South Carolina banned New Yorkers, and now we're being banned by New Yorkers from coming to, uh, South Carolinas are being banned by New Yorkers from coming up there. I have not said this publicly, but I do want to thank the governor, uh, Governor McMaster, for his work, uh, for his executive order that, re, you know, that required folks to stay at home and work from home as much as possible. There's clearly a correlation, Dr. Traxler, based upon this data that you've provided between when our economy reopened uh, and, the, and the increase in cases. Um, there's, there's a clear correlation here in South Carolina. With this being our new norm, um, what do you say to people my age, 28-year-olds and, 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 and lower, uh, who think that they are inevitable, uh, who, think that they, who think that they are invincible, rather, and who think that they can't get COVID-19? I'll tell you, as somebody who has had four COVID tests, and somebody who contracted COVID uh, is not fun, but what do you say to those young folks that might hear your comments today? Yes, sir, and so I think that certainly we are seeing more young adults and even teenagers who are testing positive. Um, it is significantly in the last several weeks been um, the largest part of the population that's growing in terms of uh, cases. 
Uh, what I would tell them is that, as you said, it's not fun. Even the minor illnesses with this are, are not fun. You feel very badly. Um, and there's also um, the other people around them that may be more vulnerable for whom catching COVID-19 may result in going to the hospital, being put on dialysis, you know, for their kidneys shutting down, being put on a ventilator to help them breathe, um, potentially even sometimes, you know, having to have their blood oxygenated even outside their body in extreme circumstances. And of course, the worst um, outcome being death. And it's really incumbent upon all of us to protect each other and especially those more vulnerable people in our society. And those vulnerable people are not just uh, people who are of older age. They're also people who, of any age, who have medical comorbidities um, or have low immune systems. And so this really is something where this is a chance for the young adults and teenagers to step up and be leaders, um, be the generation that shows that they can wear masks and that it is cool to do. Um, and you know they can still live their lives, but they just need to do it from that six foot distance, as Chairman said. And, and while wearing masks um, to decrease the risk. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, again, thank you. I wish Dr. Kirsten for um, coming and conducting the meeting. And um, Nick, the work for you. Thank you. Do I get to see you the next time you see me? Um, you're not going to win that category. You, 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 you are not going to win that contest. Oh, you brought it back and then he died again. <laughs> he that, yeah. Yeah, and he, he's been phenomenal. Actually, d all of, has been phenomenal. But I still have one question of something I'm just not seeing, and that is, and I've mentioned it to, to, to Rick, but I think it's probably out of, out of his hands, is commercials on TV. And um, I don't know if the stations would do it, public service, I'm, I'm just not sure, but um, you know, you have segments that do not have uh, internet. You have people who watch cable, I mean to say who just watch TV and they're gonna watch the news, especially now to see what's going on. And I think we, it's just a missed opportunity that we're not using our television stations to put out some of that pertinent information that we should know, but we also should not take for granted that everyone knows. and. Um, just as um, my colleague was stating about the young folk thinking that they can't get it. Well, all they gotta do is look at the death row. If they, they, can't, they, if they think they can't not get it in the age of those students and those uh, children or, or young adults in that age category, because this thing is serious. I was just informed that in my community there was an 11 month old that um, just passed with it. Not sure how true it is, but that's what I was told. So um, is there any way that we can, we can get some TV uh, public service announcements on TV with some of the pertinent information that needs to be heard and, and just reiterate it? So I will absolutely take that back to our communications team and pass that message along. Um, it's a little bit out of my hands as well, but, um, but I, I agree that any and every avenue we can to spread the message and correct information we should be taking advantage of. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, and thank you all. Thank you, Rick. Sir, President Blackwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Along the same lines, I think it's uh, critical that we get uh, the information out to the business community about this particular matrix and the scenarios. And you know, as a business owner, I've thought about these scenarios myself uh, pretty much every day, going through what ifs. Uh, fortunately, none of my employees have tested positive. None of them have come in contact with, with a positive. So, uh, but I didn't realize this was in place. I'm not sure how long you've had this on the website, uh, but. It was three days? Okay, I missed that then. But it, this is absolutely critical, I think, for the business owners here in South Carolina. Um, and if you're gonna do some PSAs and get the information out there, this is, I think it's vital that we, we share this with uh, the community so folks know uh, that this uh, scenario matrix is available because it's really important to the business owners. Yes, sir. And um, I appreciate everyone that's here, you know, helping to spread the word. This is available on our website under the businesses and employers section, as I said, in English and in Spanish. And yes, sir, and we will continue to update it and, and build upon it, as you spoke to earlier, Chairman Finley. Yeah, thank you. You know, I want to make sure, though, that we're all being realistic. 
I think the Wall Street Journal announced last week that what somewhere between five to eight percent of the population has tested positive through antibody tests at blood collection. And if I remember correctly, it's three to four weeks after an infection that the antibodies have built up enough to be detected at a sufficient level? It's depending on the type of antibody, one to three weeks, yes, sir. So when that number came out last week, that's really reflecting from around Memorial Day. I think that that number is growing unchecked every day. So I think it's important to warn young people clearly that there are dangers, but the problem is all of our children are looking at Instagram and Facebook, and they see thousands of their friends who've had it with no impact. And we can do what we want, but we are not gonna overcome that massive media blitz that they see. I think we are better off focusing our attention on vulnerable populations and reiterating that this is going to be a long haul. I was teasing Dr. Traxler the other day as she has become the optimistic epidemiologist. <laughs> but I think you said that you thought a viable vaccine may be in the offing by spring. That's nine to 10 months. If by Memorial Day, 20 million Americans had had COVID, it is hard for me to believe that that level of growth is not gonna continue Y'all, I, I, I have not done the math, but it is hard for me not to believe that that number is not going to hit 100 million by Christmas. At that point, what we need to be reiterating to everyone is vulnerable populations have got to step up their protection because it is going to be everywhere. For all we know, it's everywhere anyway, right now anyway. So as, if I remember correctly from another article I read, there are two ways that pandemics end. Medically, i.e. through a vaccine, or socially, people decide that the cost isn't worth the pain. I am very worried that if we don't pay attention, society is on the point of deciding that the cost isn't worth the pain. So what I wanna make sure we do, and I don't know how we do it, is we reiterate to vulnerable communities that they have got to stay vigilant because it is everywhere now. As a business owner, as a parent, I've seen it everywhere. Where we work, family, friends, individuals, you cannot count on everybody else to do it because there are people who don't know they have it. I can tell you amongst my children's friends, there are tens if not hundreds of their friends who have shown no symptoms. Tested positive but shown no symptoms. They did not know. We better be pushing people as hard as we can to be, take their own precautions because it is everywhere. And I, and I just, I believe it is certainly as anything that I can tell you. So I appreciate all y'all have done. I continue to think that footnote number two needs to be put on the page so that business owners can see it, that explains exactly what they need to do because you have to understand when people are reading this, they are panicking. The second thing that I would ask you is just like the, uh, the text that we've gotten, anything that businesses can send their employees every day to remind them what they need to do, social distance, when you are not working, clean. If you feel sick, do not come to work today. Do not stand at together as groups. I don't know what else we can do, but you're just trying to pierce that consciousness of today, don't do it. So it, those are the things, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick follow-up, and I, when you were talking, I, th I thought about this. I think early on in this pandemic, at, at the start, and Dr. Traxler, you can talk about this a, a little bit, a lot of folks thought that only older folks could get COVID-19. And I think that was the point that I was attempting to make that a lot of younger people initially thought that they couldn't get it. So they were flocking to the beaches, they were flocking you know, on spring break trips. And so that's the emphasis that I think that we can't just say that if you're older or if, you're, if you have a health 
you know, condition that you have to be the only person that must be vigilant. I think that if uh, I think that everybody has to be uh, vigilant. And can you, my question is, can you talk about the increase in case numbers amongst young adults? I think that data will inform my opinion here a little bit. Certainly. So um, in the last several weeks, I know that for um, and I am going to make sure I have it straight and not backwards. I believe it is um, for young adults that we have seen um, a roughly 900 percent increase and then roughly 400 percent in teenagers. I will get back to you. I may have that backwards, but it is in the multiple hundreds of, of percent increase for both age 11 to 20 and 21 to 30. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. And Representative, I think the thing we need to be aware of is amongst young people, mm -hmm. they quit testing. They are just, I mean, I hear it over and over again because I have children that age. Everyone has just assumed they had it. And so the struggle is becoming where you and I disagree is I think the number's vastly higher than Dr. Traxler is saying that have had it. And I think that's the problem is it is everywhere now. And I think we are going to increasingly come in contact with people who are asymptomatic, asymptomatic, asymptomatic. And I just think that there are people who have no idea are doing what they think is right. They, and it is, it is great to continue to push the public. But if we do not really remind the vulnerable communities of how widespread it is and how quickly it can get you, it is going to be I just think it's gotten away from, I mean, it's, it's beyond, I'm afraid, slowing down. Now, that is not a medical opinion, but that is just doing the math. Because if it started at a couple of hundred cases in January, and is it 20 million six months later? If that rate of growth continues, we run out of people very quickly. And I don't want to keep going back and forth yeah. because we clearly disagree, but I, I think that we well, all. it's not that we disagree. Right. It's right. that I just am not, af I'm afraid that, that, that mm -hmm. I think that cow's a little further out the barn than you do. I gotcha, think. gotcha. Well, well, I think that we all have a, a responsibility, uh, whether we're 10 years old or whether we're 100 years old. I think that we all have to take precautions. And I say, I think throwing caution to the wind because you're young and assuming that you automatically have it is not good advice and I think that we will only continue to see cases increase if that's our mindset. Mr. Chairman. Yes ma'am. Can she speak just a little bit real quickly about building your immune system and the different things that you can do to Yes, thank you. So so one thing I want to um to point out too regarding the immune system in this is that we we do not have uh definitive evidence yet that having had it before gives any kind of especially long term protection from reinfection. Um, in terms of building your immune system to prevent any, any illness, including any respiratory virus such as the flu or COVID-19, um, certainly eating a balanced diet, um, getting the appropriate vitamins through you know, the natural ways, preferably through fruits and vegetables. Um, if you don't tolerate those, then even taking a multivitamin um, if you don't have any reason not to. Um, you know, exercising regularly also helps keep your immune system up. Uh, getting a good um, eight hours of sleep at night, as long as you're not working for DHEC and calling uh, <laughs> results to people, um, it is also uh, very beneficial to the immune system. Um, and then, of course, we encourage everyone to still get the regular care they may need for chronic diseases that they may have, um, because we know that some of those are underlying risk factors for more severe illness if you get COVID-19, and certainly it's, it's better if you have your chronic illnesses under good control. So, and then taking a flu vaccine when that becomes available um, in the early, I guess early fall, late summer, early fall, um, to prevent at least, you know, potentially having the flu as well as, you know, COVID going around during the winter. Mm -hmm. And I do want to be clear. I'm not implying that people don't have a, <laughs> okay. But what I do want to be very clear is I think we've already lost that battle. I don't think we're going to be able to change it. And what I think we want to be very careful of is putting the resources where we can do the most good. I think we're going to look back and realize that the decision that was made to put COVID patients back into nursing homes was a horrible decision. Nobody meant it to be. 
I think right now, if it's going to be nine to 12 months, potentially on a vaccine, we all need to be aware that it is moving. It is everywhere as those numbers demonstrate. If we don't know if people get a six month or a 12 month period of sort of relief before the vaccine, we all need to be prepared. And if you are at risk, I'm not, you need to be especially cautious because if you are not, it's everywhere. I see it in employees, I see it amongst family. We just need to make sure everyone is not counting on anybody, not saying they shouldn't, but don't count on somebody else because it's everywhere. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And again, thank you all for all your time. And I will say this, are we monitoring response times? Because I'm starting to hear of four and five day response times. Um, what do you mean by response times? testing. Uh, yeah, and, and for getting the results back? Right. So um, we, I am hearing sometimes, you know, several days, um, particularly for private out of state labs. Um, but for the DHEC lab, um, from once it gets to our lab, it's, you know, about a 48 hour turnaround. Let's hope, because I, I bumped into someone just recently seven days. I was what, tested on a Tuesday morning and the results came back Thursday night. And what I want to make sure is that's what we say, because otherwise people just throw up their hands. Second thing is any way we can continue to get the testing facilities out. That is something that people are calling all the time going, how do I find an appropriate testing facility? I think that'd be a great thing for PSA or any other you know, some of the digital billboards, anything like that. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, the punching bag. Yes, sir. At this point, if uh, Mr. Elsey, how are you? If you don't mind, take us through your uh, your presentation. Happy to do it. Hope everybody is doing well after that uh, discussion I just heard. I can assure assure you, I am in, in the middle of the vulnerable group, so um, I am trying to take as many precautions as, as possible. Um, on March 1 of this year, I had been in this position about 10 months. And for those 10 months, I had spent probably 95% of my time not in unemployment, in workforce development. The biggest problem we had in the state of South Carolina from an economic standpoint was employers could not get people in, into jobs. We had 60,000 to 70,000 open jobs throughout that time. 60,000 unemployed people at that time, not drawing benefits, but unemployed, looking for work, and it wasn't a, mi a match. Skills were wrong, geography was wrong, trans transportation issues were out there, all kinds of problems. So we were working on that. It was an area that I'm very interested in, doing a lot of work in the rural areas, another area that I am uh, interested in. And on March 15th, the whole world changed. So they, someone could just as well have dropped a bomb into South Carolina. We went from uh, 2,000 claims per week. As you can see on the uh, screen, that's what we'd been handling. 2,000 claims per week until about March 15th. And then we start like a skyrocket, heading up. It takes four weeks to get to 88,000 in one week. Not cumulative, but 88,000 claims in one week. We peaked at that point and started heading back down. And over the next 10 weeks, we've got down to essentially where we are now, right around an average of 19,000. Now you'll see the number up there is lower than that, but the past four weeks, we've sort of been treading sideways. It's not dropping like we had hoped that it would, like it did for the first few um, uh, uh, weeks. Instead, it's just moving sideways. And what's that mean? 
It means more people are laying off, more companies are laying people off. It means more people are not going back to work for one reason or another, not wanting to go back to work, and I will address that. One other point I'd like to make, though, is putting this whole thing in perspective. People look at 88,000 and say, well, Dan, you're down to 18. You know, why do people still have problems getting through the system, getting on the phone and talking to people? 18,000 is double where we were at this time in 2009. The worst economic situation we've ever been in our lives in the state of South Carolina, and we are double that right now. And it does not look like we're going to get any relief from it anytime soon, because I can tell you the official numbers come out tomorrow. We can't mention them until then, but <clears throat> they're not great. They're, they, we are in a decrease at least. It's not going back up, but, but they're certainly not great. And we've got a lot of work still in front of us. The uh, first question everybody asks is, all right, you got all these claims coming in. Were you ready for it? Well, we had a plan. We actually finished an economic plan about the first week that I was here. They had all started it, did all the work. I got here for about a month, and we finalized the plan. And it was based on 2008 and 9, and told us what we needed to do in terms of employees and what employees we needed, whether it's in adjudication, claim filing, call center, or whatever, as we hit certain levels of unemployment. We pulled that thing out, we started watching it. Two weeks later, we threw it away. We had gone through the ceiling. We were in an area that no one had ever been in before. So how did we handle it? Well, thank God for this. In 2017, we modernized our unemployment system. We went completely to a cloud-based system. Cap Gemini, one of the finest, largest technology companies in the world, designed it in a consortium with us in North Carolina cost an absolute fortune to do it, but it does two things and does those two things pretty well. It processes unemployment claims that come in, and it also enables us to do the most reporting you can possibly imagine to the Department of Labor. Monthly reports, quarterly reports, annual reports on everything you can think of, and most of that data has to come out of SCOOBY. It's what we call the, uh, uh, the system. So it's good when the Capacity went up when people like Florida, you know, their system completely crashed and they had to go to taking paper applications. Now, I can't imagine what would happen in a state the size of South Carolina trying to take paper applications, but in Florida, it was an absolute disaster. They had stayed with a legacy mainframe. Uh, we were one of the few states that had completely modernized, and as a result of that, all we had to do is call Cap Gemini and say, up the capacity, up the capacity as things were going up. Now, that sounds simple. We do up the capacity but there are other issues that uh, come with it. One of those issues is because of all the reporting that we have to do, navigating the system is not as easy as you would like it to be or as I would like it to be. People call it clunky, and it probably is clunky. When this thing first started, I sat down and went through the whole thing, put in my real information and filed a claim. It took me about an hour and a half to get through it, it's doable, I can assure you, if you sit down and think about it, but if you're not used to computers, if you don't read well, if you don't have any assistance, then it can become a difficult thing to, uh, to get through. So how many problems did we have? Well, a lot of them, but we had 618,000 claims processed. 618,000 in the weeks that you just saw right there. The system works, the problem is it's not perfect. In, in the past, when it wasn't perfect, we had a support system. And that support system was made up of our call center, our 48 SC work centers spread out through the state of South Carolina, and connection points, 155 connection points where we've got computers and libraries set up to go straight to our website, Scooby, and some of the others. And people trained in the libraries to help someone file a claim. Let me talk to you about what happened to our support system. The call center is the, uh, the first thing we had to deal with. The call center had 50 people in it, 49 to be exact, pre-pandemic, handling a small number of callers per week. We could handle it. Somebody came through Scooby, they can get on the phone. We can get them through the uh, claim filing process. As the number of calls start skyrocketing, you look at the number up here, we had 239,000 callers in one week. 239,000. So the system was absolutely overwhelmed. We brought in an expert on call centers, hired him, and we have been doing better and getting bigger every day. We are up to 651, I think it is, people on the phones today. 
much more importantly, 500 of them are now trained at tier two level, tier two or tier three. The problem as we're going from 50 to 650 is that the bulk of the people on the phones don't know the answers. So they're being trained and people are being trained today and will be continually trained as long as we go through it. Uh, and I'm with Chairman Finley on this one. It isn't over and we don't foresee this unemployment situation being over for some period of time. And I have no idea how long, but we're looking at this, not just the short term fixes, we're looking at long term projects to do better on the call centers. And I'll tell you what we're doing in just a few minutes and on Scooby because it's here and I think we're going to be living with it. And with the whole virus issue, of course, the flu, we've been dealing with the flu forever and we have a vaccine, but it's certainly not foolproof. Most of the time it doesn't kill you. COVID-19, if you're over a certain age, pretty good chance you're going to go on a ventilator or, or worse. Uh, so, you know, what, what if we get over it right now in January, it's back. Well, we got to be ready in January. We cannot go through, our agency cannot go through. I don't think we could physically live it. Another situation like we have been in since March 15th of this year. So call centers, we're working on it. What happened to the West, rest of our work center? SC work centers, 48 of them. You drive by them every day and you see them all throughout South Carolina. Every one of them closed down to the public. Now you may say, Dan, why didn't you keep them open? We can't, they're not under our jurisdiction. State Workforce Development Board runs that. We're the administrative agency that serves them, but these are under the control of a local board. Your chief elected official, county council chairman in most areas appoints the board and they make the decision on closing or open. Everyone, and when I say closed, I don't mean they quit doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they quit allowing the public in. They still went to work. They took phone calls. They worked on the computer to do what they're supposed to be doing. But in terms of being open to the public and being able to sit down, look over somebody's shoulder as they're filing a claim and say, no, no, don't hit that one. You know, what the, able and available, what that means is this. So if you put that, it means you're not able and available. If you are, you need to answer it the right way or you're not gonna get benefits. That was gone. Second thing we count on are the libraries with the 150 some connection points that we got in there and the people who are trained to help shut down. So the call center is swamped as we're trying to hire and get it going. These SC work centers are closed and the connection points are gone. So right now you got a bunch of people out there trying to file claims, running out of money. And folks, I listen here, I understand their issue. Um, and I have complete sympathy for what they were uh, going through. Now, one, on one bright note, the nonprofit organization stepped up and really did a wonderful job. So if you deal with some nonprofits, you tell them they've got my uh, respect and admiration. We did a town hall from there for them on uh, unemployment, and from that came a request for them to do unemployment insurance training for the people who run the different nonprofits and community-based organizations throughout the state. So when their constituents come in to talk about whatever it is, and if they're having an unemployment claim, they can sit down at the computer with them and help them do it. So that was a very bright note in the, uh, uh, in the middle of all this. Uh, so while we're filing these claims, you know, we, we, remember this, now Scooby is set up for unemployment. From the middle of April, we start implementing brand, well before that, brand new programs. Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, PUA. That's unemployment for the self-employed. We have coded for that, implemented. Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation, that's the $600 a week that you've heard so much about, requires coding, requires changes in our system to do it. PEUC, that's an extension of unemployment. We had to code for that. Extended benefits, we have coded for that, finished it, and went live on that one today. That is yet another extension for people who have exhausted state UI, PEUC, and now they're heading into extended benefits, which is EB. Reimbursable employers, the CARES Act says for reimbursable employers, the, the, there's money to pay half of their charges. See, reimbursables are different than contributors. They don't pay a tax. If we get $100 unemployment, we pay $100 on unemployment, we bill them for it and they pay us back. They reimburse us for that. The federal government said, we'll pay half of it. And then the federal government said, but only if they pay the whole bill first. Now, you may say the $100 example, okay, fine, pay you 100, but for some of them folks, it's in the millions. And this is the first time they have ever had a claim like this. And many of them are not gonna be able to pay it. 
and they for sure are not going to be able to pay the whole thing. We said to DOL, that isn't what's meant by the law. We said they give us half, you give us half, we're even. That's reimbursement we're, where we are. DOL is doubling down on their interpretation. Uh, we have met with our legislative, the Senate staff or our senators. They are working hard to change the law, and we feel pretty good uh, that there will be a change, a fix in the law where DOL will do it the way we think it's supposed to be done. So that hospital that owes us $2 million doesn't have to come up with $2 million. They come up with $1 million, the federal government pays the other million, and we're right where we're supposed to be. Any event, one more program that had to be put in. First week waiver. Everybody heard about that? You know, it sounds like uh, I don't have to wait a week. Well, that's right. You don't have to go 21 weeks to get 20, so that's good. The other part of it was the federal government was going to reimburse us if we did it, so it's a no-brainer. We want to do it. They pay for our first week. Recode the computers. Figure out how to pay it. Figure out how to build DOL with the uh, computers. Two new state programs. Uh, the support payment program was proposed by the Manufacturers Association. We agreed with it. think it's a good program. It's where a company is allowed to pay additional money if they've got a written plan filed with us <coughs> and not interfere with the unemployment payments that the employee will get. A lot of conditions to get it, but it is a uh, good program. More coding of the uh, system. Uh, work search waiver. We know employees are not having to do work searches right now, uh, which eliminated a lot of problems and got people their benefits quicker. Requires recoding. The problem is going to come when we turn it back on. When we turn the job search requirement back on, these thousands and thousands of unemployed people who have not been doing a job search are going to have to do it. Now, we will message them like crazy starting a month out, and we can email all of them individually, but there were going to be problems when we, uh, when we do that. We worked as hard as we could with employers. Uh, many large employers would call and say, we're getting ready to have a layoff. We would assign a high-level member of management to work with them, lay it out, plan it, encourage employer filed claims, which eliminates problems for us, for the employer, and for the employees. Uh, for the most part, we all set up a system where they could uh, give us a spreadsheet as opposed to having to send in individual. Uh, <coughs> recall resistance. We set up a task force, and we got a task force. Anybody who's having problems getting employees to return to work when they make what's under the law called a suitable offer of return, you offer him the same job you laid him off from, he's got to come back under South Carolina UI laws. And if he doesn't, you notify us, we'll cut it off. And that works. About 90% of the people who have been offered recall, who refuse it, have been declined benefits. And those who have been allowed to get benefits, it's not under South Carolina UI, they are under the PUA, the Pandemic Unemployment uh, Program, which <coughs> allows people to be out for different reasons, for, for being in a status, like somebody who's sick or whatever. Being sick is not a defense to coming back to work under South Carolina UI. If, it's, if you COVID related, it is a defense there. So good program uh, and, and one that we were happy to be uh, involved in. The uh, next slide, you'll see the efforts we took to communicate with people, try to give them information, resolve their issues, get them through the claim, and hopefully they're going to be eligible and start getting money. I mean, we revised websites, we went to mobile, we did more YouTube videos than you can imagine on every kind of issue. Got a problem recertifying, watch this video. It's going to walk you right through it and show you how to, uh, to do it. Uh, we did it, two reasons, try to help the people who are going through the claims, and secondly, trying to keep them off the phones as we were uh, uh, going through this. So you can look up there, I'm not going to go through all of it, but an awful lot of efforts were made to uh, uh, communicate with claimants and, and get us through there. So what uh, <clears throat> someone asked me last week is, have you made any progress? Well, the answer is yes. We have made dramatic progress. We are much better at processing a claim today than we were on March 15th. Our call center is light years ahead of where it is. When we first started this, we could handle about 8,000 calls per day. Uh, per uh, per week. We're now handling almost 87,000 calls per week. Handling means we get on the phone and uh, talk to somebody. Average wait times, you've heard the horror stories about waiting time, 4.7 hours. We agree. We know it was awful. <coughs> if you call today, you're going to get an answer in about 24 minutes. You might hold for 24 minutes. Now, when you call, you won't go straight to hold. You go through what we call the IVR. 
interactive voice recognition where you got somebody that sounds like a person, it's a computer, talking to you. Are you an employee? Will you go into this area? Are you calling about certification? Yes, I am. It takes you there. Tries to give you information to answer your question <coughs> and then ask, is that, did that answer your question? If the answer is yes, then they can go on back to the computer and finish. If not, then they will go into the queue and wait. And that's where they would have the 24 minute wait on average. Now, <coughs> you're going to hear people say that Dan doesn't know what he's talking about because I waited for two hours or something like that. And it can happen, particularly if you're waiting for a, what we call a special skill. Every one of those people, however, at the end of the day, we identify <coughs> and try to call them and say, we saw you waited forever. Were you able to uh, get through? Did you get the help that you needed? <coughs> Um, <clears throat> you can see the uh, progress we made in processing claims. <clears throat> Social Security verification was an awful issue to begin with. Most of that was U.S. federal government's problem, not ours. <clears throat> they fixed their part. We enhanced our system where we could do it quicker. Every, by law, every time somebody files an unemployment claim, you have to verify their Social Security number to make sure it matches the date of birth and person who is involved. It's an automatic thing. Scooby <clears throat> sends out a message. <clears throat> to a website run by DOL, which connects with Social Security, to figure it out. It just didn't work to begin with. It wasn't our fault, but it was causing all kinds of problems. That has been fixed, both on their end and enhanced on uh, ours. <clears throat> Able and available issues, it, it's, when you put the PUA into the whole thing, it's complicated. Are you really able to work if you've got to stay home and care for a child? All right, well, under PUA, depending on certain things, yes, you are. So you really got to think through that question. We have revised that question several times, <coughs> both on certification and on the initial claim filing. And we went, we have had a 44% reduction in issues on that. So we think we're, we're making progress there. We have gotten 618,000 people through the system and we've paid out $2.7 billion. Excuse so me. It, it is working, yes. Sir. <coughs> One quick question. 618,000 people is what, what is the, what is the general, what is the workforce of South Carolina considered to be at this point? Uh, well, I've got that number, but it's roughly one point. Uh, it's roughly. Uh, Two million people, give or take. It's, uh, Erica, what is it? 2.4 billion. That's 25% of the workforce. Yeah, and if I remember 2.4 divided by six is 20. So we're looking at 25% of the South Carolina workforce has been through this system, assuming there is not duplication. Wow, okay. <coughs> um, and a lot of the people who went through the, have gone through the system were not employed when this started. I mean, er everybody has figured out PUA and they're right. flat filing, because under the law they say, I, mean, I could call right now, I could be in Hawaii <coughs> and could file and say, I'm unemployed because of COVID-19, and they say pick one of these 10 reasons. I pick one, I put it down, boom, that's it. I'm in, I get PUA. And I, I don't even have to prove my income, I'll take the minimum, $131, minimum by federal law. Add the 600 to it, I got 731, may never have worked a day in my life, might be a brand new high school graduate. I mean, it's a system that's gonna make criminals out of honest people. It, the money is just so easy to get, I mean, we fight it, Every day we've been on the phone trying to, uh, uh, to deal with it. So uh, what are my concerns about the future? I, I think the recall thing is going to remain an awful problem until it expires in South Carolina on July 25th, $600 per week, if it expires. There's a big push in Congress to extend it. <clears throat> if it's extended, the problem will extend right along with it. PUA fraud, you see that up there? We referred a case for prosecution to the DOL, OIG, Office of Inspector General, two weeks ago, which they are processing through, apparently, I've learned, Secret Service handles that uh, prosecution. <coughs> High school students. We have about <coughs> 49,000 high school graduates who will not go to college and will not go into the military. A year ago, that class had a chance of getting a job because the people they were competing with for a job were long-term, hardcore, unemployment people with barriers like you wouldn't believe. 
maybe they got physical problems and maybe they can't read. So they really have got it difficult. That's who the high school kids were competing with. Now, this year, they're going to be competing with somebody that's got 10 or 15 years working in manufacturing. And they're trying to compete with them for the same job. <coughs> it's going to be a massive problem for us. We are working right now trying to develop a pilot program with the COG directors. The COGs are the county governments, you know what they are, and they got the local boards under them <coughs> to come up with a, uh, a program where we can give work experience to people and a mandate a two-day soft skills training program for which they'll get a credential to try to get them to a point where they can use that to go to an employer and say, yes, I do have experience. I work for ABC company for two weeks. Recently, I've gone through soft skill training. I've passed it. Here is my uh, credential, and hopefully we can do something there. We have been very, very involved in trying to take the youth apprenticeship program into the uh, rural areas because I think that is the future of rural employment and, and young rural people. <coughs> Now is not the time. We would never be able to get enough employers to agree to an apprenticeship program with what everybody's got going on. A, a work experience program is different because we pay them and you put them to work. So many people are willing to, um, to do that. And we're, we're trying to, to uh, get it going. In the, uh, wh wh what else we've learned in the, uh, th throughout this whole process, thank you, <coughs> is that uh, you know virtual. How many of you started working from home? How many of you got employees who are doing it and realize what it really takes to do it and realize it can really be done pretty effectively? And that opened my eyes to the whole rural population and the problem they got. Uh, and, and leave broadband out of it for just a, uh, a minute. But uh, think about it. One of the biggest problems in the rural areas is transportation. How do you get to work? If you can get somebody where they can work in their home and a computer for them to work on, on their home and they've got enough skill to do some sort of IT job, maybe lower level IT, call center or whatever, all of a sudden, you've got somebody with a, uh, uh, with a job. There is a huge, huge Department of Education grant that <coughs> we're working on right now. It is, it's open to all 50 of the state workforce development boards. Uh, we are putting together a proposal. Uh, we, I can't say what it's going to be right now. I hope it's going to be IT related because IT covers all industries. Uh, and we're going to put forth the best we possibly can to the Department of Education, and if we get it, there'll only be eight states that get it, but it's gonna be a ton of money coming in. So it's a program we're working hard on in conjunction with all of our workforce partners uh, from, the, uh, from the different areas. Of course, in addition to that, I am concerned about the trust fund, and we're gonna talk about the trust fund in a minute, and I thank you all for what you've done, and I thank the Senate for what y'all have done, uh, and we'll go through why we think it was such a good idea for the sake of employers to, uh, uh, to do that. So what's our game plan? How are we going to fix it? Well, as I said, we're not sitting still and we're not assuming all we got to look at is short-term stuff. We do have a short-term and long-term project going both in both the call centers and in Scooby where we're trying to make quick, easy fixes, additional ones. We've already done a bunch with Scooby, but we still know there are problem questions out there and things we've just got to work out. At the same time, we're not waiting on the short-term project to end. We've got a long-term project going on where we're taking a long look at Scooby, an overhaul of it, and we're going to bring in focus groups, employ someone who would file an application, and employers. So we can let both of them go through it. We can see where they get the hang-ups. We can hear their questions, and we can modify the system to, uh, to accommodate that. <clears throat> in the call center, we are looking short-term at expanding the IVR, putting more data on it so it can hopefully resolve more issues. At the same time, we're getting ready to totally change our platform. Go to a platform run by a different company where we've got the availability of all kind of artificial intelligence that can help us take care of more questions, resolve more problems on the phone with a computer before it gets to the uh, call center. So we're working as hard as we can. Yes? Before we go to the trust fund and the numbers, do you mind if we take any questions sure. that might be about the process? Because I think it's this, this is getting ready to be bifurcated, the process. Right. And then what do the financials look like? So at this point, I would open it up. If there are any specific questions just about what we've seen, yes, sir. Mr. Balco. Well, thank you. Since we're, we're talking about uh, Scooby and the overhaul, I just wanted to share with you my experience as an employer who filed claims for my employees that I had to furlough uh, for a period of time. Scooby definitely needs to be overhauled. 
Uh, you know, I thought I was a reasonably intelligent guy until I spent a couple of days trying to figure out that system and navigate it for my employees. Um, so it, it definitely needs some improvement, but I will say on, on the positive side of things that uh, I made numerous calls to your staff um, as an employer, and even though I couldn't always get through immediately, people did call me back, and the experience was always very positive. The attitudes were outstanding. Uh, they answered my questions. Eventually, we figured out how to get get me through and over the over the hump and, and through the issues I was experiencing. So uh, you're on the right track with, with, with an overhaul, definitely needed, uh, but I just want to commend you and your staff for the job you did in handling my issues, uh, not only as an employer, but also for my constituents. Uh, all of us, I'm sure, feel there's dozens and dozens of, of issues for our constituents, contacted uh, the agency, and uh, I, I'm not sure everyone's experience yeah. was the same, but had outstanding support, people's problems got resolved. So thank you for your, your service and your effort on behalf of your staff in that regard. Well, I appreciate you saying that. Would you like to serve on our focus group? Well, certainly. Okay. I got lots of ideas, lots of issues that we encountered. Any, anyone else? <laughs> Is that uh, initially <coughs> I was hearing about some people who had been calling 40 and 50 times before they would uh, get any kind of response. But from what you're telling me now, the wait period now is only about uh, 24 minutes. Yesterday, to be exact, yesterday was 24 minutes, Monday and Tuesday or higher, because that's when our onslaught of calls comes in. So, uh, but, uh, so that's uh, quite an improvement. So. so it is a massive improvement. Yeah. Uh, it can still happen today where it takes a long time, but it's a special skill they're waiting for and it's like tax or something. And it's mm -hmm. other than that, people get through to a tier one or two tier one. First yes, sir. Tier two I will just finish up here and say with my experiences, it has gotten a lot better. <clears throat> um, there have been problems, but I think you look at the onslaught, there were gonna be problems. Right. My biggest concern is the slide you put forward that compares 09 to today, that you're fielding roughly twice the calls still, you know, versus 9,000 versus- That was claims. I'm sorry, claims, claims. calls. How about this? The volume is twice the worst financial situation that we've seen prior to this. My fear is that, and I think it's what you're getting ready to get into, I'm starting to hear about businesses that are beginning to furlough now. PPP money's out. They don't see customers coming back. I think that that number is going to continue. and. I think that's why this financial presentation is going to be so important. My one final question before we go into this, what do you, what do you think, do you think the $600 will be extended or what, what are you hearing on that? Because I get asked that question. The first question was how do I get through? Now the questions become will the $600 be extended? Well, uh, not to quote Senator Graham exactly, yeah. but uh, his words were over my dead body. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there won't be a compromise. The real problem with this thing is the amount of money and the, the, the incentive, incentive that it creates for somebody who makes $15 an hour, 600 a week, goes on unemployment and makes 900. I, I got it, but. So there, 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 it's, it's, I think, I, I don't know what'll happen. I don't think the, the same program will continue, but it may go down to a make hold. That guy gets 300 from us and 300 to get him back to his 600. It may be something like that as a compromise. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. I don't know if you're experiencing this or not, but with South Carolina being open and a lot of the states closed, we're res people are knocking on my door as far away as Utah. I've had people knock on my door from Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, and Utah in the last two months for work, rather it be extermination of um, pests, um, tree climbing. But we are seeing a lot of people that are coming in with innovative ideas into our community and into the workforce that's going to be competitive with other people that are already here. And I just want our citizens to understand that these people are coming to South Carolina. I was even in an um, establishment in the last month and I overheard a young lady say, I am in South Carolina establishing residence for a year because I want the college scholarships. So South Carolinians just need to know that we've got people looking at our state as a 
wonderful state for opportunity. And I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention. Good point, and I, I agree with you. Thank you. Yes. So, Erica, you want to come up, and uh, we will start moving into the financials. Uh, Erica is absolutely invaluable to us. She's an economist. She models this. She was here throughout the 08, 09. Uh, Two armed? Pardon? Who's the great Woodrow Wilson? I want a one armed economist. Uh, it doesn't say on the other hand. Why keep coming up with the Kennedy Marxist? Mark Hitler. Yeah. That's on. Okay. I'm Marxist. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I do have two hands, which is why in front of you will probably see two models. I, I, that's, yes. yes. Um, and why you will probably get asked what you think the, re the reality is. I get it. Okay. Um, so I think we left off on just looking at the amount of money that's been flowing through the agency. The only dollars that are coming out of the state's unemployment trust fund is the top line, the $614 million. The remaining programs are all federally funded. Um, the pandemic unemployment assistance, which is for the self-employed, the $600, and also the extended benefits. Which does bring us to our, do I need to move these? Okay. Optimistic and pessimistic scenarios. So when we started this, um, I was quite, quite worried that we would be paying around $80 million per week. We did not get to that point. Um, right now we are paying about $40 million a week, and that does seem to have stabilized. Um, unfortunately, though, as time goes on, the optimistic scenario here and the pessimistic scenario will converge. So originally, we assumed that the optimistic scenario would be that throughout June and July, people would rapidly return to work um, as the economy opened up and as some of the government mandates were removed. That has not been happening to the extent that we originally forecasted. And so if you look at the pessimistic scenario, that assumes that every individual who's on state unemployment benefits goes their full 20 weeks. And so that would be the maximum that they would be able to draw from the unemployment trust fund. Now, if you're looking at both of these, we do update them on a weekly basis as we get additional information. Um, and in either scenario, you see a significant drawdown in the balance. Pre-pandemic, as of February 29th, we had right at $1.1 billion. Uh, today, we have $685.3 million. And in the optimistic scenario, we get down to uh, just below 200 million, and in the pessimistic scenario, we actually do end up needing to borrow money to continue paying benefits. Uh, that money is borrowed from the federal government. Currently, uh, states can borrow interest-free through the end of the year. After that, the interest rate is approximately two, between 2.3 and 2.4 percent. Um, before you go on, because I think this is going to matter intensely, you say they are they are converging. So I see we go below zero in somewhere between November and December on the pessimistic model. Right now we're looking at late December of this if year. If you had to guess, knowing what you know now, when do you think we hit that zero number? And I get, look, I get it, it's a guess, but it is gonna matter intensely for us in September. Um, I would think that the end of December is still a likely out outcome. So without a top off, from some of the CARES money, we are going to be borrowing at the end of the year. Yes, and that's a good point. None of these graphs include the $500 million, yes. And, and I'm sorry to ask one more question that I know is an enormous guess. Assuming that's correct and that the trust fund goes to zero end of this year, where, how far negative do we go by the end of next year? I realize that that could be a terrifying number. I realize that's a long way out. Um, so part of the state law that we currently have is that we are required to forecast using the Congressional Budget Office the unemployment rate and what we think we're going to pay out. So in the fall of this year, we will project how much we're going to be paying for 2021. We are supposed to match the amount of revenue to the amount that we expect to pay out. So if we think we're going to pay out $300 million, we're supposed to set taxes to raise $300 million so that we basically stabilize the fund next year. Um, I think that we will probably get to a balance of between negative 200 and negative 300 million, so borrowing between two and 300 million before we would be able to get the first round of taxes at the higher rate for calendar year 2021. In a normal year, how much do you bring in in unemployment taxes? So that does vary each year. Um, this year, taxes were set to raise 195 million. The prior year in 2019, they were set to raise 263 million. So since 2013, we've been on a downward trajectory as the economy has improved. So 300 million would be one and a half times previous years? Yes, sir. 
just to get us back to zero? Just to get us back okay. to zero. And then we're going to have to, from that point forward into the future, build a billion dollars on top? Yes, sir. So what you're saying is, whereas before a billion dollars might have sufficed, we're going to need to go to a billion three because of the formula, because we've, sh we've blown through. Okay. We've shown that in a bad situation, we go through more than a billion dollars. So what that means is, is that potentially for the next five or six years, we may be looking at numbers that could be three to four to $500 million that we have to pay and we have to collect in unemployment taxes? Yes, yeah, so currently in state law and regulation, it's a four-year rebuild period, so that would be money collected. Okay, so we'd have to collect $250 million to $300 million a year just to rebuild it, and if we had a $200 million a year runoff, that's $500 million. Yeah. Wow. Yes, these, these folk who are actually drawing this unemployment, do they have Act, do they have to show that they're actively seeking employment on a weekly basis? At this point in time, no, that's been waived. Um, under normal circumstances, yes, they are required to search for work weekly, and that's something that we'll, do you want to address anything about that? Well, we're studying right now, as far as when we put it back. Uh, and the uh, problem, uh, when we started, a lot of people are not going to do it right. And so we said, no, we got to. Sir, we was talking about rebuild and the money being paid back. You mean paid back on small businesses or paid back on through unemployment insurance or? Yes, ma'am. I mean, what I'm saying is that if, if the previous year 200 million was collected mm -hmm. and paid in, we're looking at a rebuild number of having to be $500 million a year. So we can have a debate about whether that comes from the business or the employee, but it's, it still has to come. It, it is. It's still coming out of small business and their employees in some form or fashion, it, it is a very scary proposition. I think a lot of people do not realize that. Um, yeah. <laughs> and what we are going to see, I think, is just like he is attempting to bring call centers in, mm -hmm. states that don't crash their system or come up with a better way, all of a sudden have a competitive advantage on bringing jobs in and it's going to be a it's going to be a problem yes ma'am i know um, i'm sorry to have interrupted <laughs> that's a good question thank you on that note six states have are are actively borrowing from the federal government to continue to pay benefits uh, texas ohio illinois california um, massachusetts are all currently borrowing um, we are not sure at this point if there would be any federal forgiveness there has been conversations among states that um, if a lot of states are borrowing uh, would there be any type of federal forgiveness? There was no loan forgiveness after the Great Recession, and in that case, more than 30 states had borrowed. Um, regardless of whether we borrow or not, obviously, as we just discussed, a large rebuild is going to be required. Our new target balance is likely to be between 1.1 and 1.3 billion, which will result in higher unemployment taxes on businesses in the coming year. Um, obviously, the CARES Act money and any other money, federal or otherwise, uh, going into the trust fund does reduce the unemployment insurance tax burden on businesses in the coming years. So the next uh, slides that I wanted to show you, I'd really like to caution you that these are numbers. There's a lot of numbers. These change weekly. So I'd really like you to use these as directional rather than committing any of these to memory because they will change and they do change. Um, these uh, charts here, the one on the left, is just basically where we think the trust fund balance is going to be at the different time periods um, and how much would be needed to rebuild to that $1.1 billion that we had pre-pandemic. On the right-hand side is the pessimistic, so you're looking at about $300 million difference between the optimistic and the pessimistic scenario at this point in time as of April of next year. 
And to try to get a sense of what that looks like, we do have 20 different tax tiers in uh, state unemployment taxes. I didn't want to put every single one on there, so I just chose um, a couple for you just to kind of see. On the left-hand side, we have our 2020 taxes, which are our current rates. These are the lowest that they've been um, in over a decade because we had been experiencing such strong economic growth prior to the pandemic. Um, 2021, we would expect not to begin the rebuild. We would only be trying to stabilize the fund, basically no more borrowing or no more decline. Um, but even in that situation, as the chairman mentioned, you're still going to see increases in taxes. And there are slightly different um, amounts depending on which class tier you're in. Um, anyone in class one has had no unemployment insurance benefits charged against their business in the past three years. So they have a very, very low um, tax burden. They are only actually paying contingency assessment. And then in uh, federal law, there is a floor that the uh, tax rate, your top tax rate has to be at least 5.4%, which is why you see class 20 is kind of um, pretty stable as well. So they've hit this, excuse me, they have hit, the, hit the, the maximum. Floor. Yes. Well, unless we get into some really, really bad situations, they're not going to necessarily see any increases. They haven't enjoyed the decreases that some of the other classes have had. Um, so 2021 uh, is there, and then 2022 is when we expect the rebuild period uh, to start. And that is right now currently in regulation a four-year rebuild period. Um, so I like to look at class 19. Um, so if you're starting in 2020, they're paying approximately $300 per worker per year currently. In 2021, they could be going up to somewhere between 400 and 430 dollars per worker and then in 2022 up to 600 to 700. So your optimistic scenario in 2022 doubles in class 19? I think we need a different term than optimistic. Yes. Realistic. Yes. Thank you. Um, on the final slide here, I do have that same information. I'm sorry that the um, headers are not showing all the way across. Um, but that is all for 2022. Um, looking at what the realistic versus the realistic with $500 million input and then the pessimistic and the pessimistic with the $500 million. So what the $500 million does is it really does bring the tax rates uh, back down, not to the levels that they are in 2020, but obviously not the double or triple um, what they could have been in the absence of that funding. And at the bottom, again, each class will be different, but in the um, situation with the realistic scenario, probably see a $62 per worker per year increase with the CARES Act, whereas it would have been about $140 additional uh, without that money. And then in the pessimistic scenario, um, probably raising $126, million or $126 versus about $200. And again, please don't necessarily take any of these as finalized. We set tax rates each year in the fall. All businesses receive their tax rates sometime in November for the following year. And so these will be changing as we, as we go. One more question. Even with the $500 million top up, I want to make sure I'm thinking about it correctly. Nine, class 19 in 2020 is $300 for all intents and purposes. 2021, optimistic and pessimistic, it's going to be $400 to $410. Mm -hmm. 2022, with the $500 million top up, it stays roughly the same. The pessimistic with the top up is $570. And you're telling me that the optimistic and pessimistic for this year are converging. So even with the $500 million in two years, businesses very well could see a 50% increase in their unemployment insurance? Yes. 300 to almost, really almost a, yeah, almost a doubling. We were looking at between double and triple depending on the assumptions used. This is similar to what was experienced after the 2009 recession, um, and it's something that we don't necessarily want to go through again if there's any way to, to avoid it. I know that I think Mr. Elsey has said businesses are going to be very wobbly coming out of this, and additional taxes from the unemployment side are obviously another challenge for them. Questions? Questions? Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you.
We are. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, now, we're, we're, we're now wondering where that recession is going. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, we're, we're in a recession. We are, we are in a recession. Another quarter and we'll be in a depression. Isn't it generally three quarters of negative? Or depression? Yeah. Well, I think a recession's. I thought a recession was two and a recession depression two. becomes three, but I could be wrong. I may be wrong. Hopefully, we don't have to figure it out on time. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Was the contact person regarding that program that you talked about with the, I forgot the name of it, I wrote it, the, um, with the youth apprenticeship? Okay. Uh, you can contact me. Uh, or the easiest person to get in touch with is Mark with uh, Governmental Affairs here. He's got a card with him. He can, oh, I got his number. Yeah, he on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because uh, I've been talking to our person in Fairfield, okay. and um, we're looking at, because we have some companies that did not, you know, they, they've been going, mm -hmm. and we think that they may can take advantage of it. Fairfield so. was one thing we were considering when we were trying to do our youth, youth apprenticeship mm -hmm. We had about 14 people in Fairfield. Okay. If y'all ever have any questions about anything, contact us, folks. We're here to try to help you, um, and uh, we're eager to do it, give you information or help a constituent or whatever. Mark's always available, does a wonderful job for us. I didn't introduce everybody else we got uh, back here, but these are the guys that, that uh, make it work. Uh, Kevin, who runs technical services, does all of our reporting, and you don't write that for jobs. When I got there, his department was called policy and procedure, being a labor lawyer. Before, uh, yes, any, any other questions? Before we depart, one thing I would like to bring up. I believe, uh, and thank you all very much. Thank you. Yeah. I just, I think we're going to have to come up with a new word other than optimistic. <laughs> um, maybe less pessimistic. <laughs> yeah, dismal and less dismal. Um, but one, uh, one thing that came to my attention several weeks ago, and I think I brought this up, is, and I thought we had the article, but I don't see it. It's an, it's an article, and I'll make sure Michael gets it out. Uh, came up to my attention probably two weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal that 41% of minority small businesses may have disappeared in April. Um, many were unable to access PPP. We don't know the exact numbers, but we I have asked staff and I've gone to uh, leadership and asked that we begin thinking about a process to look at a grant for some of these small businesses, less than $5,000, businesses that have been in business for an extended period of time that is fairly simple. I think if we don't, it becomes what Mr. Elsie said, a process that people can't work their way through. But what I am becoming increasingly concerned about is I am seeing trends that make me think this is going to be longer, not shorter. The discussions I'm having with other people in business, for example, a friend who's in the catering business, they know they don't have any definition of what football season is going to look like. They're seeing weddings that were 200 person weddings becoming 40 person weddings. I think we're going to see continued furloughs and we need to have a plan to help some small businesses. Do I think we're going to be able to help them all? No. Do I think we're going to be able to do a massive amount of money? No. The target amount I have is probably $5,000. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who made the point that a significant number of businesses are going to be okay. And some of them aren't going to be able to be saved. And we're going to need to focus on sort of that middle group who we just, if we can give them a little breathing room, we may be able to help them through this. I've asked Michael to begin looking at this, helping us work through it. 
I hope that we will have a proposal for September. It is going to be it, it, it is not going to be a slam dunk either operationally or funding wise, but I hope that we can begin moving it because what I see are numbers that the population, you know, the lowest number we ever, I mean, we used to have 65% of the population working. This month we hit 52%. I mean, that is a monstrous change. And big business hires, but big business is also discovering they can do a lot with a lot less people. If we do not get small business back up and running in South Carolina, it is going to be a very, very long slog, which is why I'm interested in how can we help micro businesses, very small businesses, many of which are proprietorships, they weren't doing paychecks, they were taking draws, so there was no ability to get unemployment insurance. I think at least half a billion dollars is going to have to go into the uh, unemployment trust fund because if we don't, we are going to dig a billion dollar hole or a half a billion dollar hole for the state's balance sheet. These are some big issues, Michael. You know, I'd look for your guidance and help on this. But part of what we've got to do, and it's sort of the designation of our task force, is Unemployment Workforce and Business Recovery Committee. I think we understand the magnitude of the problem now. Now we've got to figure out how we can help because without help, I think this is going to go for an extended period of time. And what I worry about is the comment that Mr. Elsey made. What are children who ostensibly got out of school last month, where are they going to go to work? And where is the next class going to go to work? So if there are any questions, suggestions, concerns, be happy to take those up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, a lot of it have to do with testing, and I know they extended the date for the, the PPP. So, if Michael um, or um, yeah, if they can um, maybe see if there are any um, like the information they provided on the on the SB subscribe for the rentals was absolutely um, very useful um, for small businesses, especially minorities, because a lot of them the problem is kind of the bookkeeping, and as you say earlier, kind of how the employees are paid, um, coupled with the fact that some of the bank clubs, some of the banks kind of thought there was more, I guess, at risk, and they didn't have an opportunity to take advantage of the, of the loans. So if there are any um, nonprofits or organizations that can assist them, the small businesses, because I think a lot of them now realize how important it is to have paperwork done in a certain way, and um, so if there's any resources out there that can help them to, from this point forward to start getting paperwork together and um, maybe can still apply for some of the money since the deadline was extended to August the 8th, I think that could be helpful. I, I, I think one of the things that we're going to have to try to do as we work our through, way through this is make sure if there's anything we can do, it's very paperwork-like because that has been a stumbling block that mm -hmm. we've seen. Um, looked up the definition of recessions, two quarters or more of depression is more than two years. Thank you. So I was wrong on the time, but let's hope we don't find ourselves in a depression. Any other questions? Thank you. Y'all have a good one. Yep. Sir, good job. Yes, ma'am. Um, 